Well, uh, now I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Melba Crawford. I'm sure that most of you know her because of her brilliant and successful career. She holds the Chair of Excellence in Earth Observation at Purdue University, where she is a professor in the Department of Agronomy, among other departments. Crawford's research interests focus on development of advanced techniques for remote sensing data analysis and applications of these methods for agriculture and natural resource mapping and monitoring. Dr. Crawford is a fellow of the Institute of Electronica, Electrical and Electronics Engineers that maybe you know that is the most prestigious institute in electronic engineer. She was also a member of the NASA, which received the NASA Outstanding Service Award. Uh, she also was a Jefferson Senior Science Fellow at the U.S. Department of State where among other activities, she supports science sector activities with the U.S. National Commission to UNESCO. Thank you very much. Actually, most of you probably don't know me, and that's because, <laughs> you know, I'm from a totally different domain, as you uh, gathered, and um, and I'm really, you know, new in this environment, as are many of my colleagues that are listed here. Um, so we have a team at Purdue that is working together. That's uh, at this time about 50% engineering and 50%. Um, from the plant sciences and it's turned out to be an amazingly you know great environment for all of us um, we uh, are you know what we think is a black box what they think is a black box is you know something that's maybe not so uh, difficult for us and we can open it up or maybe we even wrote what's inside the black box and vice versa we don't even understand much of the you know most of the biological terms that they use so it's been an interesting year and uh, I'd like to share with you some of the the challenges and opportunities, particularly the, the technologies that uh, uh, that we've been exploring. Now, I was my talk is a little different than I was asked to to talk about originally. Don't tell April, but part of that is because, as many of you have noted, um, you know, many of us are doing very similar things, and so you know, I, there's not a lot of value in having tremendous repetition. So I'm going to focus on um, some of the things that I have not noticed being focused on in the post or in previous talks. Okay, so I was asked to talk about the possibility of uh, remote sensing actually from space uh, for phenotyping, and most of you already know the challenges with that. Um, but there are some possible opportunities, and uh, so we'll talk about this in a multi-scale kind of mode where we'll you know, I'll discuss space and then airborne platforms, manned and unmanned. Um, you've already seen quite a range, and particularly in levels of, of capability and, and advanced technology, uh, associated with proximal sensing, everything from a bicycle to something you push through the field to something that's automated to what we lovingly call here our, uh, we used to call it a phenomobile until we learned that it had already been trademarked by the Aussies. So it's now our Fina Rover. And um, so uh, we'll, I'll cover some of the issues and opportunities there. So in thinking about this from space, then uh, all of you know that for phenotyping, spatial resolution is really important. So this is kind of where we are, actually, even though things are in, in the civilian side of things, even though things are advancing, the typical kind of characteristics of these sensors are they have a few spectral bands, and now they have a panchromatic band, which is higher resolution. And so the um, panchromatic bands are down about 30 centimeters now, which is actually valuable for a number of things that are, that are in phenotyping as long as the plots are not too small. One of the advantages is you get it all at once over anything from 10 to 20 kilometers in extent, and so um, that's, you know, a real advantage. 
Um, the commercial platforms in the U.S. and in the U.S. we have to have the um, anything less than five meters is commercial. And um, so Digital Globe, um, we have these continuously merging companies, um, and just as there are in the you know plant sciences. Um, so the two birds that are up there right now are owned by Digital Globe, and one's QuickBird, and the one that just launched um, uh, as a brother or sister to its pair, its twin, uh, are is called Worldview Three and Four. And uh, what you'll notice about those is um, they not only have the panchromatic band, but they've now got eight multispectral bands, and they're narrow. So you're not getting this really broad kind of multispectral data anymore. They've not only done that, but at a, a slightly coarser spatial resolution are bringing in the sphere. And then uh, to help with the atmospheric correction, then there's some additional bands that are uh, have been added. Now, th since there are two of them, and because they can roll the satellite, then each one can see not only because they're polar orbiters, approximately polar <laughs> orbiters, day and night, but they can roll the satellite, then on the average they can see any place on the Earth about four and a half times a day. So that's uh, an advantage, particularly with regard to cloud cover. There's a commercial constellation, this European called RapidEye. It has a, it's focused a lot on agriculture. Uh, what you see down here um, on the lower right is this constellation, and um, what they have, of course, is much better temporal resolution, but they're focusing on the sweet spot of five meters, which is the um, of resolution, which is what's really useful for most agricultural applications. So the advantage of these sensors is a lot goes into actually spectral calibration. They have very high fidelity geometry. They don't deal with the wind. They're up in space, and they're very well tracked. Um, on the downside, you know, they've got a limited number of spectral bands, so if you're looking at indices, then you, um, you know, have a limited number for your predictive models. You can get photogrammetrically derived heights, and um, the fact that these are in orbit in, and very well tracked helps with that. But spatial resolution is the big limitation. So as we look toward um, uh, the UAS uh, as an airborne and manned aircraft, um, we have sort of the same class of things in terms of, of instruments. Um, the motivation, of course, is that um, for all of this uh, space and airborne platform type of technology is that in situ sensing, uh, in situ in field monitoring, in situ sensing is, is really, really expensive. Uh, even armies of graduate students can't, uh, and undergraduate can only do so much and uh, so if you were to come down under the clouds then you can possibly use UAS but you have to be very careful because when you deal with the spectral signatures then there is an effect associated with the scattering that uh, and the shadows associated with being under clouds so but on the other hand you know cost is important and access uh, on a high temporal resolution basis is important so UAS uh, large and small fixed wing and Photograph are all part of the game now. So when we go to the proximal sensing, which we've already noted, then the thing you get is uh, low risk. Low risk from the point of view of no, low risk to your sensors, and when you get the data, then usually it's uh, you know pretty reliable. You have pretty really, uh, good repeatability. One thing that I haven't seen talked about very much here is positioning. And positioning is, is very, very critical because most of you want to have replicates and you have small plots and you have a lot of varieties that you're evaluating. And so uh, it doesn't take much to have your plot that you've extracted from some image be in another plot. Um, and so some of these issues, and the, by the way, the precision planters uh, are fine, except for the fact, well, maybe not all the seeds come up. Or maybe there's, you know, some glitch with the GPS, the RTK. So um, uh, these have some advantages uh, in, in terms of that relative to airborne platforms. But on the other hand, you do have some uh, problems, and we had a lot of problems this last year with accessibility. Uh, this wonderful FINA rover down here, I couldn't get into the field because it was so wet. Um, you know, you have issues with, uh, uh, at that point, with this was for sorghum, with the sorghum growing very rapidly, and pretty soon you couldn't be in the field much at all. The other thing that uh, is both an advantage and a limitation relative to many of these uh, platforms, the advantage is you can put a lot of sensors on them. The disadvantage is you have the challenge of synchronization. So you have one GPS IMU on 
this platform, it's not usually good enough because you're moving too slowly. And, uh, and so you don't have enough motion for your IMUs to actually respond. So you need to have two, and that's times two in cost. Um, you're, you have to trigger your camera simultaneously and, and your LIDAR. And all of that has to be brought in into an environment where you can actually analyze the data. So it's really a very big data problem. So here's where we kind of are just in the, the general, uh, I would say, state of practice. That's both for agricultural monitoring and most phenotyping. We have high resolution broadband visual cameras. Most of them are Nikons or Canons, um, et cetera, Sony's. And um, they are often used with filters, if you know, many of the other commercial sensors. Uh, and they're all frame cameras, which is an advantage because they're internally consistent geometrically. The um, focus of most of the uh, output is on geometric characteristics that is associated with phenotyping, which is actually not a bad thing because if you look at the models, most of them use geometric characteristics, heights, um, canopy coverage, etc. And so these are, are pretty good for that. So if everybody can get in the game uh, pretty inexpensively and at least get started. So the data products are you know, geometrically corrected. Uh, and I say corrected in, in quotes there because again, it's all relative to what you need. You don't need to hit an ant with a hammer um, if, you know, if what you need is an ant. But if you need to have multi-sensor data that's very well aligned for temporal studies, then you need to have a bigger focus on this than is possible with most of these commercial um, available packages. Now what you get out, of course, again, is the band ratios. And the, the companies are getting smarter. Their filters are getting narrower. Well, they were always smart. They just didn't uh, um, develop sensors for this particular application, and so the bands are getting narrower. But one of the things is most of these are not radiometrically calibrated, and they are also, um, you know, flown without any regard to uh, conversion to reflectance, which is also not easy from broadband sensors. You can get some sort of a reflectance factor, but not true reflectance. So we have this project that has been funded by the Department of Energy. Um, Purdue has a partnership with IBM. And this gives you a little bit of an overview of that project. Uh, it's actually uh, looking at sorghum for biofuels. And so the multiple categories associated with the project include the part that I'm involved with, which is the data acquisition and processing, then the uh, information extraction, uh, which is, uh, again, utilizing our capability from electrical engineering. You know, it's a nice thing that the people in computer science and electrical engineering have actually already dealt with data that have many of the characteristics of what you're dealing with, uh, except you have a bit of a harder problem in, in some cases of being outside and not in a controlled environment, um, because much of the technology is very similar to biomedical engineering. And um, so a lot of the algorithms can be uh, readily adapted. And with the big data, then you have to have a significant computing infrastructure. And uh, we share the analysis component and the integration uh, with the genomics team at uh, IBM, IBM Watson. So just blowing up the data processing part, then what we're acquiring is a typical kind of um, data from RGB cameras, multispectral cameras, but we do probably more than most here with hyperspectral, so I'll talk more about that. Thermal is also on our in our suite, but um, we haven't had uh, a lot of drought in Indiana recently. So um, uh, our other focus technology in terms of new technology is LIDAR. Our ground team uh, is always there, and of course we totally appreciate that because, you know, how can you lie with pictures if you've got them uh, basically providing the ground reference? Um, we have a visualization group that's just getting going. Um, I'll talk a lot about the data processing piece today. And then once you get through this, which seems like, you know, a whole bottleneck, then you have the opportunity to do a lot with feature extraction, simple kinds of models initially, perhaps the spectral indices, and then moving on to uh, other kinds of, um, of features, which would be everything from texture to latent features that are going to be extracted from hyperspectral and uh, LIDAR data that could be potentially approximated use as a waveform um, and then integrated with the, uh, the modeling team. 
I forgot to mention that there's another p group uh, uh, associated with this project, and actually uh, it's not just Purdue and IBM, but it's University of Queensland and CSIRO as well who are providing the APSIM models. So starting with this issue of positioning, then uh, uh, this is an example. Uh, when you do crop monitoring, you know, and you're looking at the back 40 and you want to know if you've got a wet hole, uh, you don't need precise positioning. Um, on the other hand, as you see here with these plots, then it's a totally different game. And designing and developing and utilizing targets is very important, and they need to be surveyed in um, with, uh, with high quality um, surveying equipment. And then uh, if you remove them, you need to you know, be able to, to uh, bring them out every time you do a, a, um, a survey. So just showing you the kind of thing you can get with RGB cameras, and actually you can do it if you have the right processing with even a DJ fan and a GoPro, as long as you have the targets in the right software, then you get X and Y RMSE of about two to three centimeters, um, and this is flying at about 15 meters. And then uh, in the Z, which is always worse, the vertical, then it's four or five centimeters, although every now and then you can do better. And these are from copters. So this is a resulting kind of a mosaic that uh, was then uh, utilized and uh, was analyzed photogrammetrically to derive height, and so this is uh, an output of that. Okay, and so the orthophotos, which need to be, uh, are the baseline, and, and the people who deal with these RGB cameras and orthophotos don't care about the spectral data. So you see the very, in fact, it's actually kind of helpful to have the uh, flight lines have slightly different, because this takes so long to acquire, because these things fly so slowly, these rotorcraft, um, then uh, actually the matches for photogrammetry are fine. So this is just a geometry-based map. So let's just see how it all lines up, um, and you can see one up here, this is over time, that these actually are two different dates, they don't care, they want geometry. Now you see the field, the effect of the field team coming in, and then uh, we had a windstorm and had lodging in uh, August, and um, that just gives you the time series. So this is the fundamental base. Now, when you start to analyze this, then ortho uh, photos have very good geometry, but you have also brought together many, many uh, images. And um, and so if you're going to do analysis of uh, to obtain leaf counts, uh, other kinds of, of plant level information, you need to go back to the original associated imagery. And you need to actually be have that transformation function so that you can actually position it on the ground, but you can analyze the original data where you don't have the resampling issues. So some of the things that we've been doing, um, and there are many ways to do this, um, are um, do late leaf counts multi-tempo leaf counts, and that can be a surrogate for some kind of a, of a measure over time, potentially with uh, uh, light attenuation and, and some other characteristics of, that of interest. And so the kind of baseline is always some sort of color segmentation initially, maybe a thresholding even, as simple as that. Um, edge detection, and then connecting all the components associated with the edges, and then um, creating uh, a simple uh, leaf edge model. But that's that's not enough. So then you need, as we know, the edges, and particularly of, of sorghum uh, and corn, which are, you know, uh, many times you have occlusions, many times you have, uh, you know, leaves that have very unusual angles and twists. Then we uh, analyze them, finding the edges of these um, leaves. Then we break it into um, slices. And then we do the connected components on the, on the individual uh, leaf segments. And then you connect the leaf segments into um, what we call leaves. And this just shows you an example. And then doing a manual leaf count, then you know, you're never going to be perfect. But, um, uh, and of course, you, you, know, you can envision what the problems are, what, where they come from, from occlusions and uh, et cetera. So the bottom is the, the patching of the, the patches that are associated with the leaf segments. And these leaf segments can then be used for all kinds of things in terms of counting or angles or finding the center of uh, the plants. So we tracked them through time, and you see here four different dates. 
and um, this is just to show the visual segmentation at the first part. But um, then more interestingly, then what you can do is you can track the, um, then this is at the plot level, so you have, these are the plot numbers in this particular case, and you see the multiple dates, and you see it growing, but, uh, and a very interesting, uh, Mitch Timester, who's our PI, came in and said, I know what this is, and, uh, you know, immediately from the plot. And they begin to relate it to phenomena uh, associated with the genotypes. So we localized those patches and uh, uh, then formed the uh, identified the leaf centers. This is a, an optimization problem that's uh, got a number of constraints. It's a Bayesian sort of approach. And um, blowing this up, you see that uh, you know it's not perfect. So these are the plant centers that, um, that were identified, and these are the ones that were um, by, these are the ground reference in this little uh, plot, and these are the ones that were computed. And then looking at it in a little bit bigger scale, then what we see is, um, and each row is just the centers are identified with different colors. But you see the first one did well, perfectly, but you see there are some problems. Here's somebody that got missed, and here's a complicated um, set of plants that, um, and this is the early stage of growth, which is when you would typically start doing this, uh, which was confused. Now, the next step then, uh, so you can those, leave those people behind that are interested in uh, the plant level, uh, individual plants, and you move on to the people that are interested in plots. And I already alluded to some of the issues associated with the plots. And um, so one of the things we did, now this looks very easy, but um, we identified, so if you were to look at the um, this uh, height across here, then what you see, of course, is in between. Uh, this is not height, excuse me. These are values of a, of, of a, a spectral response. Then you see these lines that um, uh, are going to be associated with the lows. So we formed an optimization problem, and we said, well, we know these rows were planted, you know, a certain distance apart, but in turn, it turned out that was not a very good solution. And so we ended up having to um, develop, a, use this just as a prior and develop a more complex algorithm. Um, we were successful. This is the plot layout that's common to many people um, with the individual um, plot ident identifiers. And uh, you see, although it's, it's fairly um, detailed and, and, and could be blown up, um, the boundaries of each of the plots. And here comes the problem. So you get the little rectangles, but you see because of these issues between in the alleys, between the plots, and even some of the fact that some of the rows are not straight, that you have individuals that are going to have to be aggregated in some way and to accommodate this. If you don't, you're going to have the wrong canopy coverage because you'll have the wrong value in the denominator. So there are a number of ways and you just have to decide how you're going to deal with this. In our case, we um, ended up taking the median of the boxes and so um, we were sure to keep um, the, uh, the enclosing box to, uh, to um, be associated with, with actual plants and not, not uh, the alleyways and then uh, extract the features. And so this gives you the final plot extraction where each of the, um, the colors is associated with a particular um, variety and then overlaying it. Now, advancing this um, um, further, then uh, we're moving in terms of, I would say, sensors very fast. The nanotechnology uh, arena is moving very fast. They're even uh, developing spectrometers now. Now, whether they have that, you know, high fidelity spectral signature, uh, spectral capability is yet to be determined. But things are moving faster, they're getting lighter, and so they're going to be able to fly uh, or uh, utilize these sensors on um, uh, platforms in, the, in, in great numbers in the near future. Um, so the other thing that uh, has improved dramatically is the, the miniaturization of GPS IMUs. And so now you can even have a GPS IMU that, it, that will record, not just process and store on the camera the location, which is what almost all of the, the consumer grade ones do that are used for um, flying the aircraft, but um, the ones that are, um, are for high fidelity surveying are actually smaller too. So I'm going to, I, my particular area of research is in hyperspectral sensing. I kind of need to move quickly here so that uh, we get through this and I show some of the other colleagues' work. 
Um, so we know all of you are, have um, been introduced to hyperspectral sensing and one of the things I'd like to point out though, and many people here are not actually thinking too much about it, I think, because of the altitude of the UAVs, is you can do much better atmospheric correction. You say, I'm only 30 feet off the ground. Yeah, but the, the incoming radiation uh, actually come, goes down through a significant atmosphere. So if you want reflectance over time, it's best to be even the, uh, to um, be able to use uh, radiative transfer models, which are now becoming widely available as well. Um, we also know that the challenges are you've got a lot of spectral bands that are redundant, highly correlated, and uh, we call this the curse of dimensionality. Um, the orthorectification problem is also a problem because all of these are vir virtually all of the high quality ones are push broom sensors, so they are not internally consistent like frame cameras. Um, I'll skip over this because you already know there are many, many indices that can potentially be computed from hyperspectral data uh, that are, um, that, you know, are, are advantageous, particularly related to, to photosynthesis and water-related features. Just a quick bit, uh, don't wait to, uh, don't hold your breath relative to hyperspectral spectral sensing uh, in space because uh, to get enough photons on your detectors to actually register, the spatial resolution has to be coarse. Um, the only operational mission that has been uh, up successfully uh, has been flying for about 15 years and it's run out of fuel and they're slowly deorbiting it. That's the mission I was involved with, she referred to. Um, but there are others on the uh, we're all, all waiting for, the Europeans, the Japanese, uh, and even NASA are, um, have uh, missions planned and uh, hopefully will soon be flown. In the meantime, we're dealing with airborne platforms. Uh, this is just uh, um, another graphic that shows some of the things that are, are now possible with UAS. One of the things you have to have, though, is you have to have a GPS IMU fixed to the camera in order to have uh, this, uh, any kind of hope of decent geometry. So um, here's an example of where the geometry is uh, not so great. And uh, you see that, uh, and part of it's due to the wind. We fly on both fixed wings. When you have a $50,000 instrument, this takes much better care of it than a rotorcraft if you have to go down under any circumstance. But there are disadvantages as well. Um, we live in windy country. We can see the wind turbines from our, our farm. Um, so that's also a problem. Um, from the FINA mobile, FINA rover, then uh, uh, we can get very high resolution hyperspectral data and we've just started looking at some of that data from this last year and as you can see you can begin to look at uh, subleaf level and and we're very excited about that now uh, some of the things, as I alerted, alluded to, that we have to deal with are associated with uh, the geometry. Um, so you don't have to pay quite as much anymore. As long as you're willing to go a few thousand dollars, you can get a decent GPS IMU. Um, but don't try to get one for 500. Um, in the meantime, we're working on post-processing because we have a lot of data. You know, engineers are never, um, you know, <laughs> We never give up. Um, so given the data, and we spent a lot of time getting it, then we're post-processing it to turn this into this. And um, we're also integrating the GPS and the IMU um, with both the hyperspectral and the RGB cameras so that this will hopefully be automatic uh, in the future. And this is, as I said, the before and the after. So uh, what did we do uh, to do this? Well, I went back and I said, you know those guys that extracted the plots? They're pretty smart guys. And so um, this happens to be uh, the plot level data extraction. And <clears throat> what I wanted to do was to be able to extract those, um, those rectangles. Uh, so we applied their algorithm for their thresholding. And you could see here um, where the boundaries are. And you could see some of the challenges. So they had to adapt their algorithm them to um, not extract just linear but piecewise linear features and do that automatically and then we utilize the rectangles for um, selecting features for doing the precise orthorectification and uh, this is the raw data before anything's done and this is course level um, orthorectification um, with the grid laid on top this is without the grid and this is even though you can't quite see it well uh, is an improved final refined orthorectified image and these is just blowing it up for subsets of the image. 
Okay, so the information you get, okay, is now geometry and spectral information. You can fly through this plot. Uh, you don't have, so many times people are using statistics like the mean of the values of the plot. You know, you're losing a lot of degrees of freedom. You're losing all the variability. So you want to fly through this in time and you want to do it uh, not utilizing all of the data. Okay, so I have just um, a couple of other things I'd like to show you. Um, show you we've successfully accomplished the goal. And uh, the, what I want to do is talk about LIDAR. So LIDAR is something that, uh, as I said, has become now possibly uh, viable for, um, for both from UAS and from, uh, from these uh, fixed platforms. And um, system calibration, again, I, I know this is very boring, but when you, you, if you need, want to really know where you are, then uh, you have to be um, very careful about the calibration. What you'll see here is if you drive forward over these targets and then you turn around and you go backward, this is where the same object appears, these targets. So they're not, this is not yet well calibrated. So a lot of calibration work needs to be going on. And so algorithms are being developed, protocols to actually do that. And then uh, this is the kind of result you could get. Now given this is sorghum, you can't really see. Um, these the colors just refer to some general ranges uh, of values, but what you see is the information on the top. This is intensity and that's the heights. Um, I want to show you in the end uh, some comparisons though, because I haven't seen anybody do this here yet. Um, so this is a, these are some transects, and what you see in the first case is the, um, the image-based DSM photogrammetrically derived, and you see the laser-based um, GSM from the FENA rover, DSM for the FENA rover. So what you see is a lot more variability, okay, from the LIDAR than the photogrammetrically derived DEM, because it's just due to matching. And so I think that's a real advantage relative to, um, to plant science, to be able to look at that. And these are three different profiles uh, asso associated with that. I also have profiles that are associated with photogrammetry versus the UAV-based LIDAR. Okay, the first one was from the Phenomobile. You see they're mostly the same. And that reason is when you fly with a, U a LIDAR with a UAV, then what you are getting is less penetration, of course. These are not the same kind of l laser systems that you fly for surveying uh, on manned aircraft. But it's giving you still very good height information. So in closing, I'd like to say that, you know, there's a lot to be done in terms of the processing. Um, but the really important thing is once we get done with this, there's so many in, uh, very interesting kinds of characteristics that we hope that uh, will be useful uh, in, in your domain of uh, phenotyping and in the phenogeno environment. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that we have time for one quick question. Thank you very much for the very elaborate uh, work. But I just wondering, uh, can you uh, give some estimate of the cost involved in all this, roughly? Sure. So, um, so the cost. So, oh, okay. So, again, it depends. So, w for the proximal sensing, then if you're going to have. Um, you know, and it depends if you're doing research for a, a seed company, then you can afford, if these are, they're spraying, they're about $100,000, these big uh, high clearance tractors. So the sensors for all the hyperspectral <laughs> sensors that are high quality are, are on the order. So most people are flying Wiener, uh, only up to about 1,000, and the data is only good up to 900 because of the silicon detectors. Then you have to go to other detectors when you move to the near IR and the, and the SWIR. So those are 30 the forty thousand dollars, the um, the Swears are one hundred and thirty thousand dollar kind of cameras. Um, they're common in all the greenhouses, but they're not. But you know that's what makes it very. You makes you really nervous when you're putting it on an airplane. Um, the um, you can do with um, RGB cameras and the right software and very inexpensive targets for a few hundred dollars. You can fly. This guy laughingly say my colleague took his daughter's Christmas present. Uh, he took the GoPro camera and the, and the DJ Phantom and he flew all last year because he didn't have any money yet. 
Uh, and so you can successfully derive some geometric characteristics and then with a few hundred dollars do a better camera and about a twelve hundred dollars uh, get a, an S1000 which is the rotocraft it's a DJ rotocraft um, and so you can enter without uh, you know a huge budget but when you start to move the the lidar um, units uh, are about eight thousand um, dollars and depends on the, whether they're survey grade eight to, eight to twenty thousand dollars a piece um, so you kind of can, can get into the market with um, um, some very reasonable budgets and then you add to your equipment also as you become more experienced Yes. Yes. I think that you know what you're going to see is the people who do laboratory level work um, have you know in their in inherently much more expensive equipment, relatively speaking. Um, but they also have, you know, re very reliable results of one sort. And then I would say we're comparable on the other end, but can enter at a much lower um, cost. Thank you.